NXT tonight. Tune in for the main event. Leave remembering the tag match. And by the way, get get this. Just just do it. What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, here with your NXT review for October 28th, 2015. Started right out of the blocks with uh, some highlights from the TakeOver special of uh, Dana Brooke versus Asuka, and Asuka's exchange with Emma after the match leads us into our first match. Right away, no opening segment, no talking. I know... I'm the first one to defend that on Raw, because on Raw we need it. It's a three-hour show. It sets the pace for the night, etc. On SmackDown, when it's only an hour-long show, you don't need it. We had Emma with Dana Brooke, obviously. Sorry. What the hell did I just do? We have Hot Heel Emma with Dana Brooke taking on Shazza, or Shazza, which is another new diva on NXT, apparently. They make very brief reference to the fact that Shazza was the last opponent of Emma's before she joined the FCW slash NXT program. <coughs> so they tried to have a backstory in about that much time. Uh, so this girl's from Australia as well, which is great. This was a squash, but because I'm a big fan of Emma, I'm going to run you through this squash. Collar and elbow tie-up into a, into a headlock, into a takedown by Emma. Another collar and elbow tie-up into a knockdown, into a basement drop kick by Emma. Mud hole stomp by Emma and a one-punch knockdown. Snap mare and a kick to the back by Emma. A roll-up by Shazza out of nowhere because, you know, we need to know that she has a pulse. Clothesline by Emma and a neck vice whiplash and a veal by the hair by Emma. Is it? Okay. And I'm going to sound like an absolute artard here. Somebody tell me down in the box below, because I've only ever heard it. And I've never seen it written down. When you grab somebody by the hair and whip them across the ring, or, or by the arm, or by the head, or whatever, is it a beal or a veal? Is it with a B, like like Bobby, or is it with a V, like Velma? I'm, I'm asking because I honestly don't know, and I don't want to perpetuate the wrong answer. But uh, whatever it is, by the hair, and I've lost my place, obviously. Shaza eats turnbuckle. Again, and again, and again, and again. She throws a couple elbows to show us that she still has a pulse. Emma hits a drop toe hold, and she eats the second turnbuckle. Emma sandwich in the corner, and the dilemma by Emma gets the win for Emma. How many times did I just say Emma in that last sentence? They didn't call it the Emma sandwich anymore. They didn't call it the dilemma anymore. So, I take it that's from her cute baby face, and, you know, everything has her name in it. Roddy, roddy, ra. But they don't have new names yet. The the dilemma, though, the the uh, half-Indian deathlock into the crossface is pretty damn brutal. I mean, she doesn't do her little cha-cha-cha thing as she goes down into the bridge. But even the bridge, you have somebody in an Indian deathlock, and you're basically throwing yourself into a bridge to get that crossface. So, even when she was a baby... Like, looking back on it, even when she was a babyface, it was a pretty damn impressive move. Nice outing by Emma... I mean, yeah, it was a squash, yeah, it was against a jobber, but she did her stuff. Uh, Sh Shaza or Shaza or whatever this girl's name one was, was a very, very good punching bag. Dana didn't get involved other than being on the outside and being a loudmouth, which is great. We replay the James Storm debut from last week with that new move, the eight-second ride that he does in the lame music. But the one thing... The one thing, and I'm going to get into this tomorrow when I do my Q&A, because I know there's a question about it. There's a couple things that bugged me about his debut. One was his finisher, one was his music, and one was they took his moniker away, the Cowboy James Storm, because it said Outlaw on his sights and everything. So I was afraid they were going to rename him the Outlaw. He referred to himself in, an, in a post-match interview as, you know, allow me to introduce myself, I am the Cowboy James Storm. That seems like a tiny little thing, and maybe I'm the only one that nitpicks on these tiny little things, but that's good. If you're going to have these guys come in, and we finally reach the point where they get to keep their names, Samoa Joe got to keep his name, for example, CM Punk back in the day got to keep his name, Daniel Bryan's name got reversed, but if you're going to let them keep their name, then just let them keep their name, and obviously he does the sorry about your damn luck, which just makes me smile. We have the announcement officially that, uh, Apollo Crews, who won the uh, number one contenders battle royal, is going to have his title shot against Finn Balor next week on a regular episode of NXT. I can't imagine any shenanigans going down there. They don't see, you know, Apollo Crews, you're the number one contender, but you're not, you're not getting it on a pay-per-view. You're just getting it next week. Um, you know, I, should I talk about dirt sheets? 
Should I? Should I? Should I? Should I? I can't imagine that there will be any shenanigans in that match. But we we replay packages on both guys. We replay the video pack. This is throughout the night, mind you, but I'm just going to get it out of the way now. They did the uh, the promo package that they kept on playing before Apollo Crews debuted. They played that again to highlight what he can do. Uh, the, the Finn Balor, like, Inside the Demon or whatever it was, special that they played before uh, the, the, the pay-per-view in Tokyo, um, they played little bits from that. They put, they sliced and diced that into a, uh, into a highlight reel for Finn Balor. Very, very cool. Even though, like, I, I was just making fun of the fact that it's just on a weekly show, they didn't save it for a special or a pay-per-view, they're still attempting to give it that big fight feel. Um, so, one step forward, one step back, I'm sure it'll be a great match, and as I say, I'm sure there will be no offbeat shenanigans, as, uh, as uh, Lance Storm would say, in that match next week. We have a tag team match up next that should be on pay-per-view, just because of quality. I don't really like any of the characters in this match, because I don't think any of them have characters per se. They are the quintessential do their talking in the ring guys, and I like that. Uh, I know Gargano and Ciampa have their followings from other places that they've been. I'm not familiar, so they're new to me. I'm just, from the bottom of my heart, I'm just being honest with you guys, like I always am, I have not seen these guys until they joined uh, NXT. Uh, Jordan and Gabriel, or sorry, Jordan and Gable, I'm out of breath because it's cold outside, it's Canada, which means the heat in the house is cranked up, which means I get out of breath very quickly, and that happens anyway, so... You guys know how it is. This is not the most professional uh, outfit in the world, is it? I mean, I'm drinking iced tea out of a fucking curly straw, for God's sake. Uh, Jason Jordan and Chad Gable versus uh, Johnny Gargano and Masanto Ciampa. I'm still waiting for somebody to tell me if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The C-I-A-M-P-A, -A, I'm assuming is Ciampa, because that's how the announcers say it. Gable and Ciampa start with a test of strength. Knee strikes by Ciampa, and they have this pinning reversal sequence of all these different amazing chain wrestling maneuvers that I do not have names for. A headlock, a trip, and an armbar by Gable. A double headlock by Jordan and Gable on uh, on Ciampa. Double, uh, sorry, Jordan works on the arm of Ciampa. A trip, a double stomp, and a knee drop combination from Gargano and Ciampa. A headlock by Gargano and a corner slam by Jordan. Gable rides an armbar and but catches a pendulum kick by Bar Gargano. I can speak, I swear. I'm not going to... I keep tripping over his name, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, it just is what it is. Armbar over the ropes by Gable. Basically, great binds the arm and throws himself over the ropes, so his entire body weight is pulling down on his shoulder. Basically, um... There's no other way to say it. It's as if he's choking his arm instead of his neck over the rope. It's, it's, it's a good little thing. It's a hell of a lot better than I'm explaining it. Armbar over the ropes and a trip and a monkey flip. Chops by Ciampa. Springboard through the rope spear by Gargano is fucking pretty. I'm just saying. And it's the perfect thing to send us to commercial break. I love that I can say, even though we're on the WWE Network for $11.99 up here in Canada, I can still say sends us to commercial break. Uh, kitchen Sink by Ciampa on Gable as we come back. Front, we have a we have a series here where there's a front face lock, or sorry, a front face lock on by Gargano that he turns into an abdominal stretch. Ciampa tags in and slides into the abdominal stretch so that the hold is never actually broken. Now Ciampa's got him in the in the abdominal stretch. Gargano comes off the ropes and hits him with a drop kick in the head with nowhere to go and no way to protect his damn head. It was a dirty looking move and I liked it a lot. Chops and elbows by Gargano. An overhead arm drag by Gable basically uh, basically throws him over his arm like a sack of potatoes and slides him forward. This is me. This is me. This is this is what physically happens to me when I'm trying to explain something that I don't have words for. Just just don't watch the video. Just listen. Just pretend this is a podcast and, and don't watch me do this. Um, Straps down in a corner spear and an exploder suplex out of the corner by Jordan. Running knee by Ciampa. Sandwich of kicks in the corner by Ciampa and Gargano. Springboard DDT by Gargano. Jordan tosses Gargano and hits a gorilla front first slam. Back suplex and a back suplex. Oh, sorry. Back suplex, back suplex. Um, basically, Jordan and Gable do this thing where they pick up one of them. I think it was Gable. Uh, pick the guy up in a reverse suplex, arched back for the suplex, and let go of him in midair. The other one 
caught him in that same suplex position, dropped him down with a bridge for the pin. So it's a back suplex, back suplex pin by Jordan and Gable, and Jordan and Gable get the win. Um, I'm not doing this nearly the justice that it deserves. I will be blunt and honest on that. I'm really not. I, I, I actually encourage you. If you're watching, I don't know why you'd be watching this review if you didn't watch NXT, but if you don't have the network or you're waiting to watch NXT in the next couple of days, go back and watch this match. There's a whole lot of chance, there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of really, really good, like, you can tell these guys are happy to be there moments, and I'm not saying that to be sappy, but it changes the way the match feels. The crowd loved this match. The crowd loves both of these teams. Um... The fact that the um, that Jordan and Gable come out and they basically look like Team Angle from back in the day of uh, Benjamin and Haas, and they sing Jordan and Gable's names to the tune of Kurt Angle's old music. So it's like Gable, Jordan, Gable, Jordan, and it's and more than anything else throughout this match. Cause, and on NXT you get it a lot and it, and it lasts for a couple of seconds throughout this entire match. This is wrestling chance. If you're those four guys in that ring, you can't ask for anything better than that. If you're the guys putting the NXT show together, if you're William Regal, Triple H, if you're the, the talent directors in the back or whoever, you know, Giant Bernard and Billy Gunn and supposedly Lita's joined that team, whatever, uh, the driving force behind these guys, you got to be sitting in the back with your heart beating out of your chest just like this for the crowd to consistently, consistently throughout the entire match, just this is wrestling. Because you got to you got to think full sale. Uh, as far as I know, the tickets are free, and they're in the university. They're stationary, always in one spot. So you got to figure it's a lot of the same people every week. So they run the danger of people getting sick of things and wanting more and constantly being harder to impress. So in front of that crowd, it's kind of like the upside of them having an impact zone if there is an upside. But if you can impress that crowd that potentially is watching wrestling every week, uh, you've done something. And they are loud. And the NXT fans are loud. We know this. But, like, especially at Full Sail. Because Full Sail takes it on as their own. Those, 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 this is wrestling chance is a fucking fantastic thing. We show a replay of the debut of Nia Jax, which anybody that's been following this channel knows I wasn't that impressed with, to be completely honest with. Um, Nia Jax takes on Kaylee Ray uh, in another squash realistically. Kaylee Ray is about this big, and she's from Scotland, and she kind of looks like she's got the same attitude as, as Becky Lynch, or the same temperament or personality or whatever, which is funny because she's from Ireland. Um, it's not Kaylee, it's not K-A-L-E-Y or whatever, it's K Lee Ray. Uh, like I say, she's about this big, and when she's facing somebody the size of Nia Jax, no offense, I'm not body shaming or anything like that. We, we all come in all shapes and sizes, for fuck's sake, look at me. But she really did look like a toothpick, and it really looked awkward in this match. Before Nia Jax even got to the ring, the commentators went crazy. That's the cousin of The Rock! That's the cousin of The Rock! And immediately, before the match even started, I'm, I'm really doubting that the crowd knows who Kaylee Ray is. So the fact that they were chanting Kaylee Ray at Nia Jax is kind of a bad thing, is it? Uh, this is kind of short and sweet. Corner tackle by Jax and headbutts. Rikishi-style ass in the corner. Again, not mocking her, but literally that that running, the roof shaker that uh, Rikishi used to do where he'd run at them and basically turn at the last minute. The entire rear end directed at the opponent. That's what it is. A couple of elbow drops by Nia Jax as she tr as Sorry. A couple of elbow drops by Nia Jax, Dominator style backbreaker, a boot by Kaylee Ray, and a drop kick is pretty much the only offense she gets. Um, Nia Jax hits a messy looking spine buster thing, and 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 an equally messy leg drop to get the win. As the commentators play her up to be the greatest thing ever, and I'm sorry, so far she's just not. I'm not saying I'm, I'm closing the door on her as a fan, I'm really not, but I am sitting here saying at this point, if you're already clinging to the fact that she's The Rock's cousin, it's the Charlotte thing, it's the, it's the, who else, anybody else, it's the Natty thing, it's the Roman Reigns thing, it's the Tyson Kidd thing, it's the, anybody else, the Curtis Axel thing, don't. Do it. You can mention it as part of their story if they do something that's similar to the that it, like when she'd had her debut and her finisher was a modified rock bottom. I, I just sat here and I shook my head, honestly. Uh, one of the matches that they promoted at the beginning of the night was Enzo and Cass versus Dash and Dawson. Dash and Dawson I like, but the name the the name of the mechanics 
is lame. They, 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 they introduced them to the ring as Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder. Um, I don't think the commentators ever refer to them as the mechanics. I've seen it written on websites and by people in the YWC as the mechanics. I don't know if it's actually a thing or not. I'm hoping it's not because it's really lame. Just putting that one out there. But we don't get to see this match anyway because during Enzo's opening spiel, the mechanics um, jump them. They toss, they toss Enzo out of the way quickly. They toss... Colin Cassidy into the side of the ring, which as we all know isn't a, an apron anymore, it's that big ass LED thing, that, but his whole body doesn't hit the, hit the ring side, his whole body hits the ground and it's just his one leg that whips up and smacks into the, into the LED board. I don't like the LED apron. I, I, I've probably mentioned that before, I don't like it, especially during a match, it takes away from the match. In the entrance, it, it looks strange. Um, I know I might be in the minority there, I know WWE's trying to keep their look modern and keep things new, different, flashy, to keep our attention. I understand that. I understand why they make changes like this. I'm just saying this one for me is a miss. That, that's all I'm going to say. But uh, in, this, in this case, it did serve its purpose. Uh, uh, the LED board is a harder, more believable hard surface than a cloth apron, so that's a thing. They, dra they drag his leg into the, into the board, they bring him into the ring, they're double teaming on the leg, to the point where they put his leg in a, one of them, don't know who, I wasn't paying that much attention and I was writing my notes quickly, one of them puts a leg submission on Cassidy, while the other one goes up to the top and jumps and stomps on the leg as it's in the submission hole. I don't know how that didn't also hurt his partner, but you know, we'll, we'll leave that to the suspension of disbelief. Now, before we knew that J uh, Gable and Jordan were going to face... Um, uh, Ciampa and Gargano tonight. The reason we initially tuned in for tonight's uh, NXT was Tyler Breeze versus Samoa Joe. This gets all the more interesting by the fact that Tyler Breeze has made his debut on SmackDown, on Raw, and uh, so on and so forth. So it's really one of those, he's never going to get the NXT title, is he? He really isn't. He's going to, I, I'm sure somewhere in a storyline down the road, say Samoa Joe makes it up to the main roster. Samoa Joe is going to grab the NXT title before uh, before it's all said and done. He's going to go up to the main roster, and if they feud again, the first thing out of Samoa Joe's mouth is like, yeah, you left NXT before you could touch any gold. Because he really just loses all the time. He really. It's funny that they've got him feuding with Ziggler, because he really is NXT Ziggler. Uh, I, I made the joke before this was actually officially a thing before they actually did the debut on SmackDown. I said if, if uh, Breeze fought Ziggler, it would be an awkward match to book because nobody would win. Um, I don't say that with a smile on my face because it sucks. Both of these guys deserve to be winning matches, but whatever. Uh, the crowd's into it. Let's go, Tyler. Let's go, Joe Chance, before we even get the match started. Tyler starts the match by bailing three times. Bails out, gets back in slowly taunts Joe, Joe goes at him, comes back out again. Finally, Joe gets sick of it, he chases him around the ring, uh, typical cat and mouse thing, Tyler jumps on Joe as they get back in the ring, hits him with a clothesline, and jabs body blows and chops by Joe, Breeze bails again, and gets hit with a suicide dive by Samoa Joe. Now, not only is Joe a big guy, not only is Joe a big guy flying, but he's a heck of a lot bigger than Tyler Breeze. Somebody the size of Joe coming up and over the ropes out of the ring onto somebody like Tyler Breeze is a fucking impressive sight. I'm just putting that one out there. Coming back from the commercial break, a running elbow and an insegree in the corner by Samoa Joe. Snapmare and chops in the back by Joe. A one arm choke into a codebreaker like backbreaker by Breeze. Now, what I mean by that, Breeze wraps Joe's own arm around his head, goes around behind, rolls backwards. And basically, um, if you can picture a code breaker where he does, where he brings the guy's face down on his knees, he does that. But he does it to the back. Um, I, I guess a, I guess a better comparison would be if you remember uh, Carlito's backstabber, except he brought him across the knees sideways with the choke. I. I suck at explaining things, guys. I really do. Um, Breeze chokes Joe on the second rope after the backbreaker. Chops and headbutts by Joe and a drop kick by Breeze. Rear naked choke with a post by Breeze. A leg drop and another rear naked post with a choke. Or sorry, rear naked choke with a post by Breeze. Inverted atomic drop and a big boot by Joe. Orton style snapmare power slam by Joe is really nice. Um... Urinagi out of the corner by Joe, but the Muscle Buster fails and uh, Tyler Breeze succeeds with the supermodel kick. Both med and trade punches and chops, but the um, when Tyler Breeze, there you go, words, 
backwards. Tyler Breeze tries for a roll up. It's reversed into the Kikita clutch. And Joe gets the submission victory. Tyler Breeze, who's now supposed to be a believable main roster guy, just tapped out on NXT again. I don't take anything away from Samoa Joe. Obviously, I've been a fan of Samoa Joe longer than I've been a fan of Breeze, but God damn it, the guy needs a win. This match was great. The only thing I have against this match was it was way too short, and this match should have happened on a, on a special. I think by the time they have their next special, which is, I think, in November, December time, somebody correct me down in the box below, because I know you guys keep track of this stuff a heck of a lot better than I do, but my fear is, by the time... Uh, the next NXT special comes around, uh, Tyler Breeze is going to be full-fledged on the main roster, and he's going to come out of NXT without without a really big career-defining victory, and that kind of sucks. If he goes to the main roster and gets a victory over Dolph Ziggler, um, I guess you could say that's what that is there. I guess that'll be his version of Owens beating Cena. No, no, it's not. That's dumb. Owens beat a guy that never loses... Uh, Tyler Breeze will beat a guy that never wins. <laughs> That's not the same at all. I don't know why I said that. Guys, this was a great episode of NXT. As I say, you tuned in uh, at the beginning of the night for this main event. You walk away from it thinking about that tag match. It's fucking epic. Uh, on a personal note, Hot Heel Emma fucking squashed that Tiza, Breeza, whatever the hell she was. Chick, which just makes me happy because Hot Heel Emma is fucking awesome. Everybody's crying and whining and complaining that we need to bring Bailey up to the main roster. We need to complete the YWC for Four Horsewomen, or the IWC Four Horsewomen, or the WWE Four Horsewomen, or the NXT Four Horsewomen, or whatever the hell they are, I say no. I say no because Hot Heel Emma and fucking Alexa Bliss need to come to the main roster before Bailey. Because when Bailey gets up there, there needs to be some heels for her to fight. Right now, there's Paige, who's just turned heel, and the Bellas, who are all leaving the ship, apparently. Much to the joy of everybody else and the groan of me. Um. But yeah, not, not being said, the Nia Jax thing, just, I, I'm I'm leaving it really, really strongly with the message of please show me something NXT. Uh, I want to be excited about this chick. She looks like she could be a powerhouse uh, when she gets on track, when she finds her groove. I'm just saying she needs to find it, because right now her matches are awkward as shit. Uh, no Asuka on this show, which is kind of disappointing, because she's the one that's debuted recently that I want to see. Um... Yeah, all in all, great fucking show. I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check. Subscribe up there. Talk down there. Start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I'll talk to each and every last one of you later. But for right now, I'm tagging out. Bye, guys.